When we quantify things and quantize things, we actually lose touch with them in a somatic way. Hello, Vicki Robin here, and welcome to What Could Possibly Go Right, in which we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, and social creatives, people who innovate in service to the life that we share. We ask our guests to respond to just one question in the face of all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? Our guest today is Douglas Rushkoff. This is his fourth time on this podcast because you love him, and frankly, so do I. Uh, he was named one of the world's 10 most influential intellectuals by MIT. He's an author and documentarian who studies autonomy in a digital age. His 20 books include Survival of the Richest, Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires, as well as Team Human, based on his podcast, and the bestsellers, Present Shock, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, Program or Be Programmed, Life Inc., and Media Virus. He also made the PBS frontline documentaries, Generation Like, The Persuaders, and Merchants of Cool. His book, Coercion, won the Marshall McLuhan Award and Media Ecology Association honored him with the first Neil Postman Award for career achievement in public intellectual activities. Rushkoff's work explores how different technological environments change our relationship to narrative, to money, to power, and to one another. He coined such concepts as viral media, screenagers, and social currency, and has been a leading voice for applying digital media towards social and economic justice. And now here's my friend, Douglas Rushkoff. Well, 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 Douglas Rushkoff, it's time for another cruise around the question, what could possibly go right? And when I reflect on other existential times in US history, like the Civil War and World War I, World War II, the depression, the nuclear standoff, the brutality of racism, and on and on. I wonder if this cliffhanger moment is like those. Apocalyptic, up close, but from further back, a transition and seemingly for the better. But the climate chaos is for real, right? And we are we are trembling before AI. Will it kill us or thrill us or a bit of both? And at the same time, there's so much to admire in the movements for justice, in the interest uh, in regenerative everything. So as Dickens says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And so here we are, Douglas, I'm asking you to help us to orient. You are always on the quirky and curious edge of the culture. You see glimmers and trends before the rest of us do, and you are on team human. You believe in humans and our capacity to be for one another and all the other critters. So that's just my riff, my friend, on the one question we've been asking for three years now in the midst of all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? So you want answers to all that? No, I can, I, no, that okay. just, that's just sort of like <laughs> raindrops on your head, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. right. I mean, where I'm at these days is, is, trying to help people develop the the skills tools and sensibilities they need to kind of if not navigate this new terrain uh just um orient in it you know the the my chiropractor used to tell me, poor, dearly, dearly departed Mark Filippi, um, used to tell me, um, you need, in order to feel safe, you have to have both your feet on the ground. Put your feet down on the floor, um, even if you're sitting, because otherwise your body doesn't have the cue that, and without the somatic cue of, here I am, mm -hmm. um, you are just so you know when we're when we're certainly when we're online and all these spaces and all that we don't we don't have a somatic 
context for these places. And we are using really new and undependable maps and road signs and symbols and facts, factoids to decide how things are, where we are, how we are in relation to this other thing. You know, it could be as simple as this person has more likes than I do, but you know, it's the easiest way to understand it. It's a metric. And, but then those translate back to the real world of, oh, that person has more money in the bank than I do, or more this and more that, or I'm like, I'm moving toward that goal, but what is that goal? And is that goal a, a house of cards goal that's actually taking me further away from uh, 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 any uh, connection to other people or myself or grounding in nature or whatever? So we're, we're all, and, and COVID certainly didn't help this, although it had started before, um, we are all really, well, I won't say we are all, I feel really destabilized and feel like a lot of people are asking me similar kinds of questions. But where, where am I? How old am I? How, are, how am I doing on the, the timeline of my life? Everything's happening all at once. I don't know what show to watch if I'm missing blah, blah, blah. So there, there, there's a, a strong temptation right now for people to negate the, let's call them God-given mechanisms for establishing that orientation, which is there's a person sitting over there, sit down next to them and, and ask them what they think of the weather, you know, about those Mets. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. There's people who need favors, people who you could ask a favor from, even if you don't need a favor, just to initiate a, a social connection. I mean, that's why I keep talking about putting the social back into socialism. <laughs> that, you know, it's not about the Politburo counting toothbrushes for, you know, the next five years, which is what socialism kind of is known as. It's more, are we being social? You know, and there's so many places to be social. It's just most of the places that you get to be social are the places that you earn money not to have to be. You know, the coffee shop, the laundromat, the street, the subway, you know, the, all the places that privatization wants to tell you are the nasty, scary, um, unpredictable, potentially violent places where people of lots of colors and different religions are going to be. That's where you want to go. That's that's the place. You know, it's hard, though. It's hard. I mean, and I think back, you think back to when you were oriented in life. It was when, for me, the spaces where I, re when I remember being the most oriented, the most feeling the most real and alive were, and again, I know this is a friggin' leftist word, they were public spaces. <laughs> oh my God, watching fireworks on the 4th of July on the West Side Highway or, or doing a picnic in the park or going to the end of the dead end block where we had a barbecue. I don't know whose it was. There's one barbecue pit and we all went there in the end of the block and had weenies or whatever. These are the library, all these places where we did stuff, block parties. It was, it was, uh, uh, we, we, we co-opted. No, we, we utilized public space to have public selves. And boy, you go to, I just went to Montreal for a couple of days. And well, first, most of the people just kept saying, I'm so sorry for you. I feel so bad for you. If you need help to get up here, to move up to Canada, I'll help you, I'll help you get a visa. It's okay. I'm so sorry. But, uh, you know, except for that, it was also the sense of there was a, uh, a public square. There was, it was a, a different feeling when you have, I know in some sense you have public health care and public education and all those kind of things, but it's like, wow, these people are living well. And it's assumed that they're going to have clean subways and, and stuff. And it's not just because they have a different tax system. It's because they have a different um, value system and a different way of orienting, of feeling well-being. And we don't have that here. Well-being is is a key, you know, like what is well-being? You know, it's like it's a somatic experience. It's when all your needs are sufficiently met and in balance that that there's 
You don't feel like you're pushing your body through something, you know, through, through a tight subway. There's a sense of ease. And there have been efforts to make well-being the met metric, you know, the gross national happiness yeah. in Bhutan. And even, you know, quality of life metrics, all of those are there. It, it, it seems to me, as you're talking about when you were a kid, that before I had a, a, a smartphone, you know, before I had the internet, but, you know, definitely before I had a smartphone that brought the world to me 24 seven, or, or when I was growing up and there was nothing smart, you know, I was born before TVs, you know, so um, before commercial flight, you know, I was born in the dark ages. And it seemed to be that your world was what you could touch, but you had to trust reliable people to take care of the bigger thing. It just seemed that it was a more um, parochial life as well. And it was more sort of trusting, you know, like, okay, Edward R. Murrow, you know, we, we sort of knew who, who to trust. Is that it? It, it? And the other thing is, it, is it just everything is disintermediated? So somehow I sit here and I feel like I can, I could, if I had the energy, influence anybody anywhere you know, through any social media or whatever. What is this that is, what is tumbling us down that rabbit hole of disconnection? I mean, this is funny. It's it's like, this is what I was trying to write about in Present Shock in like 2013, is when we quantify things and quantize things, we actually lose touch with them in a somatic way. So when you talk about, and I love the idea of a happiness index or a gross domestic happiness or <laughs> quantifying care and nurturing as opposed to just blah, blah. But the minute you put a quantity on it, the minute you quantize it or quantify it, it you kill it on a exactly. certain level. It's gone. Exactly. Or you're, you're, you're acting as if once you're quantifying something, the underlying communication of quantification is scarcity. Oh, we're quantifying it because there's not enough. But baby, I got enough nurture for everyone. I got, I, you know, I really do. I do. I mean, if people would just take that part from me, it would, I'm a fountain. And so is everybody. There's so much nurture. If you put down our, put down the gun and put down the computer and the mouse and the numbers, it's just, ah, right? Exactly. You know, where are you going to do it? That, you know, that nurture, that was a 9.2 nurture experience. And over there, I got a 9.7. You know, it's like, it's very, you know, sex in the city, like rating your orgasms on a scale of one to 10. It's like, fuck <laughs> you. Yeah. Fuck you. If you're, 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 I hate to be in your head when you're having your orgasm, calculating <laughs> the which metric to give it. But, you know, it's sort of nurturing is kind of like that. And, and those, it's that, it's that the thing that's so off for us is that quantification and quantized understanding of the world that uh, that abrasiveness of the living on the ticks of the clock rather mm. than on the spaces between the ticks it's mm. all ticks it's all and and that that tends toward the fascism that tends totally. toward the authoritarianism, the the clicks, the clicks. I mean, even that the Hitler was so good at it. Click, 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 click of the feet on the ground. You know, right. everything, it's it's to the same clockwork universe understanding of things. Everything's on the beat. We are all together. I am the cure. You know that that thing. And because we're living in such a highly quantized environment we're all becoming fascist and authoritarian in one way or the other. And I'm not mm. just saying that things are equal, but there is a brittleness on the far left that matches the, 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 the quality of the brittleness on the far right. The mm. with us or against us, oh my God, he voted for Trump, I can never have him over to my house again. Right. And it's like, that's your you're you're getting brittle the 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 social justice warriors even the well-meaning ones in academia can throw out certain babies with the bathwater. yes McLuhan is a white man from canada and blah 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 <laughs> but or and his works are still useful in a media media studies curriculum you know we can decolonize the 
curriculum without removing everyone of value that 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 isn't you know that that's from the colonizer community i mean i could see not having columbus day because the guy was an asshole right uh, you know really worse right. than, worse than a slave right. owner like a right uh a, 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 a would-be caligula i mean this was a, a really violent horrible dehumanizing there there's nothing good there um but but let's think you know let's think on on uh before we uh adopt that kind of defensive posture through everything it just makes it harder it makes it harder to make eye contact just to, to to see where people are coming from i get it that our you know this the the social justice side of it says that your intention doesn't matter right your intention doesn't matter because you're part of a system of whatever of oppression but your intention if you have a, a magical worldview do what thou wilt your intention is all you have that's your will is you your consciousness precedes matter your your <laughs> that's you are we are all speculating as we move through the biological experience you can't you can't take that away from us either at the same time it's too scientific it's too genetic it's too uh it's it's eugenic on a certain mm. level mm. that there's no intention that there's just the code that you are uh uh you know the the, the code that you're enacting and that's how you hear it, that, that we have we have no souls, we have no uh, right. will, we have no we have no heart. I know, and I don't like that, especially, you know, that's the problem with the, when the when the the right, sadly, the right has taken magic, the right has <laughs> taken satire and Operation Mindfuck and all the great uh uh you know, the great yippie techniques <laughs> of media subversion are on the right, and the right has taken god the right has taken the soul you know I, can't i be a good soulful lefty atheist totally you, you know, can spiritual you, dude? you have permission thank you but we <laughs> yeah. should be right it's like totally. and i get it marx is 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 facts and fascism is metaphor but in their extremes it doesn't mean that we have to abandon metaphor and allegory altogether just because it's what the fascists use. We can have a little of that, a little literature, a little dreaming. A little dreaming is okay. So, uh, you know, it's almost, I, I almost feel like there's a something that you're, you're not punching at, but there's something that is a niggle, something that's bugging you, that you're talking to or about. You know, what is, what is it that so bugs you? Is it the quantification? Is it like... You know, years ago, I was talking to um, somebody in the sustainability field, and and the big breakthrough he was working on was that we're going to put a price on nature, because if we can put a price on things like the the price of the value of a forest, a standing forest, then it has some competition with the value of a forest that's cut down. And it's like, ah, you know, it's like it it's such a Western viewpoint. It's like you know, dominion over nature, dominion right. over it's hierarchical it's binary it's like it's like the computer is everything is sort of like it's displayed on your screen but it's just one zero one zero one zero one zero. right it's everything is and that's the ticking that you're talking about is it you know, like a global sense that we're trapped in the matrix and that you're trying to find your own way out and tell us how to get out is that what we're was is that what you're doing now i don't feel like it's a global problem. I feel like it's a largely American problem. Mm -hmm. And because the way America asks these questions is basically, how do we make environmentalism and human welfare compatible with capitalism and finance? And you don't, that's like the answer. Right. So when you start saying, right, and there are all these plans, oh, so we'll create the market value of the forest so it can, no, you know, in capitalism, nature will never win. You can't do it. Markets were invented and the financial markets, which are an abstraction of the market, were invented to extract value from living things and convert it into dead numbers. Totally. That's what it's for. So it's not going to save nature it's going to destroy nature in another way 
You know, that's mm -hmm. all we can really do with it. You know, so I don't bless her AOC's heart and everyone. I don't believe in the Green New Deal. Oh, we'll make solar panels and that'll create more jobs. And blah, 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 blah. Where did jobs come from? To 11th, 11th century social construction in order to take people's value from them and pay them a wage for the hour rather than for what they've made and all. It's like all these underlying assumptions are all basically embedded industrialism and embedded capitalism, and they've reached the end of their lifespans. So, but instead right. of transitioning to a post-market, post-financialized reality and celebrating that we got there, we are clinging to that thing as if it's real. You know, if you tried to pitch the public library in America today, they would say you're a communist. They, they or mail, the postal service, any of those things. They, they don't make sense. But you go spend a few weeks in Italy, nobody's worried about their health bills. Getting sick doesn't bankrupt you. It's like, oh, oh no, they pay tax. Oh, they do this. They walk around. They, they walk around talk to each other it's just so weird they, they so you're still, just saying that that like we're the you know the united states and wall street particularly is the center of financial power center of capitalism and that it's it's totally resistant it's not going to you're not going to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear you're not going to get blood from a rock and you're not going to get well-being from capitalism you're not it's not what it's for it's a great tool Capitalism is a great tool to grow an economy in a hurry. It's just like speed is a great tool to stay up the night before the test. <laughs> exactly. And it, it is, and it works. It works it, with, with limit. It works. But you got to realize what you're doing is you're going to, we're going to accelerate this thing because we got to get more growth out of here than is really kind of happening. So we're going to dig into this soil with some uh, big tools and we're going to wreck the soil matrix for a while and we're going to pay for it on the other end, just like some kind of hangover. But we're going to get the necessary growth to, to, you know, to do this thing. But boy, we don't even capitalists now are almost quaint in the digital finance markets. The capitalists are like the workers used to be because the capitalists are being exploited by digital capitalists, by financial markets, derivatives and derivatives of ultra fast trading algorithms that are exploiting the former traders who used to be exploiting the businesses who used to be exploiting the workers. Well, so this is also parallel argument around AI and, you know, that painting that won some prize. You know, and you, you you look into it, and you you don't see the artist. You, right. you don't quite see the 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 beating heart of it. It's exquisite. It's really exquisite. It's well rendered, and it's interesting. But it's just it's just the result of AI scraping images from everywhere and reassembling them. So, so like I guess my question then is is. <laughs> How do you and I, Douglas, and a few other friends, and maybe everybody, how does the world get re, re and sold? It's like what we are talking about is that the world that we've created is soulless. Humans have souls. AI doesn't have a soul. It's something about being born and dying, about, about our relationship with infinity you know, eternity. There's something about the soul, right. and whatever you say it is. And we're building around us a soulless world that we think is our tool and it's not, it's our master. And so how do we bust out of this thing? Well, I've developed an app <laughs> that uses a square wave, a sine wave and a solenoid to induce soul in the listener, you pay three ninety five a month. You can download it, play it with earbuds, totally. and your soul will be manifest. This is so great, and everybody yeah. can. So, does everybody end up having the same soul if they're using the same? No, you get your own soul. It, you it do. It triggers your soul if you take well. If you want your own soul, then you also have to take those supplements that I'm selling. Uh, and it's $100 a pop, right? Yes, each dose. Yeah. But it's worth it because it activates the app. 
<laughs> if you don't want to do that for whatever reason, right. um, you can just send me money and <laughs> then yeah, I, you send yeah. me $10, then find anybody, anybody around who's willing to look into your eyes for two full breaths. It takes about five or six seconds. Two breaths, in and out, in and out. That long, you'll feel your soul. Wow. Can we do it without sending you $10? Tell us the truth. Why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can. You actually, it turns out you can. Yeah, I was just trying to make some money off it. Um, you know, you can, um, you don't have to send me the money. But no, you can do that. It's available. It's available to you. And it's not placebo effect. It's real. It's recalibration. You just recal. but get your feet on the ground. Get your feet on the ground. Go outside. Look at a bird. <laughs> look at a bird. I mean, it's really, I mean, I was going to say look at a squirrel, but I know a lot of people live in cities and don't have squirrels around. Squirrels are really good for it because they're very playful. They're, 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 and they're furry. Um, but I won't describe them. If you haven't seen one, it, it's, it's too difficult. Um, but no, look at a living thing if you can. But if you make eye contact with another person and do two full breaths, there's scientific something proof of will all happen, these right? Yeah, mirror neurons, oxytocin, totally. all that kind of stuff. It's really good. And I'm not. I mean, yes, it'd be great to make love with somebody and all, and do all those, you know, bigger things. But you know, if you don't make love properly, if that's the good word for it, <laughs> um, it's not going to happen anyway. You know, it, it it'll happen more easily just looking at someone's eyes for two breaths. Totally. See, see, now you, I just heard a talk you recently gave and you had like a four part, you know, not like a four point plan. It's sort of like a matrix of four, four things that if, if we were to be able to swing it, we could change things. So I'm going to, I'm just feeding you your line. Do you want to go there? I'll go anywhere you want, sweetie. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I spent most of COVID looking at people who were similar to me, but coming up with plans, what, what what seemed like very techno solutionist inspired plans for how to get people to do that. How are we gonna get people to spend more time doing this? How are we gonna get people to care more about the environment? How are we gonna get people to, and I'm like, wow, you're getting people to do this and getting people to do that. It feels very top down manipulative. Like, well, if you're gonna use some technique to get people to do that, what if the bad guys are using that? They're better techniques to get people to do that. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's all, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna get people, getting people to do that. How am I gonna get her to do that? It's like, you know, you, seduction is very different, my friend. You don't get her to do something, you, you be. Um, so I was thinking if we want to engender the sort of society where people are doing what, uh, uh, what might release us from the enslavement of capitalism, the way that the Israelites were released from the slavery of Egypt, which is a metaphor, mm. Mitzrayim, the narrow place, you know, I mean, well, for, what you have to do is, is create conditions where people can smash their idols. That's what the plagues were. The plagues mm -hmm. were the desecration of the Egyptian gods so they could be released because they worshiped them themselves. You know, blood desecrated the Nile, locusts desecrated the corn and all. So it changed the circumstance. You change, you don't change the water. You, you dig differently so the water goes in a different place, right? You don't try to move the water. You change the environment so that the water, the stream will, will go somewhere else. So I was thinking about, you know, what can we do to, to change the register, if you will, the, the, the language, the environment from digital capitalism to something much more sharing and nice and human and all. And I looked back at all my work really from the beginning and figured out that I've been really trying to do these same four things. I've been making the same four interventions over the course of the last, whatever this has been, 30 years of writing books. I mean, the first one is to denaturalize power. You know, it's the, it's the thing that happened for me when I uh, first played with computers. And uh, the, I, I saw, 
Well, I was asked, how do I want to save my first file? The, the, the woman who is running the computer lab said, do you want to save it as a read-only file or a read-write file? And I was like, well, what's, what's that mean? She's, well, read-only means other people can read your file. Read-write means they can read and edit your file. And I was like, ooh, I want to save read-write. Let's see what people <laughs> want to do. Let's read-write. But then when I left the lab, I started looking around at things in the world, wondering why were so many things in this world saved as read only when they're <laughs> actually read write? You know, and that's sort of the early, it's sort of a really simple version of understanding Foucault for the first time and going, oh my gosh, all these things that, that I took as real are actually social constructions. This stuff in my pocket called money. Well, it's not money. It's it's paper. It's it's. I could make my own money. The only reason I can't is because there's a law. You know the sacred truths. Why are they sacred? Because some priest locked them down. All these things. The way the the roads are in New York. I mean, I was a New Yorker. I thought that cities are grids. I thought that's what they are because that's just what cities now. No, turns out you know Manhattan that grid pattern. Someone decided to make it like that. You know, I didn't realize it. I'm 19 at that point. I'm like. Oh, it wasn't just like God didn't just do this. It wasn't an island. Right. People decided, I get it, and they numbered them. Like it was a they did that. You know, so so much of the world and I looked at TV and said, Oh my gosh, I've been raised in a read only media environment of television. Why, why can't we make the television? It's like, oh, and then video co- recorders came out and camcorders and Rodney King. And I started to see, oh, you know, so so denaturalizing power really means seeing being able to distinguish between nature and the social constructions created by powerful institutions that look like nature but aren't like you got to have a job you got to do this you know you got oh wait a minute those are rules that some powerful person made and they should be up for discussion right the up for discussion is my second intervention you know and that's to trigger agency it's it's back to Joan Rivers when she says, uh, can we talk? Can we talk? You remember that used to be her line? Can we talk is triggering agency saying, well, wait a minute. If these are read right, then why can't I change them? Why can't I rewrite them to my specifications, make local currencies and rewrite the codes and build whatever I want? You 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 can, right? <laughs> you you should be able to. And then once you trigger people's agency to actually take charge of the world that they're in and grow their own or roll their own or whatever (laughs) it is, um, you realize that that works best if you're doing it with other people, which is what gets to my third one, which is is, uh, uh, re-socializing people, or I've started to get more political with it, re-socializing the people, right? You know, or my (laughs) idea, you know, to put the social back in socialism. How how do you re-socialize people? And that's, again, it's like, in America, if you've got to put a hole in the wall, you're going to go buy a drill at the Home Depot, right? You're going to buy a minimum viable product drill, use it once, stick it in the garage. When you go back to try to recharge it, it's not even going to work and you're going to throw it out. So you spent 49 bucks to get the one hole. And it's not even that. It's that you've sent some kid into a, a, a mine to get the cobalt rare earth metals to make the thing. You know, that poor little, you've seen those movies, those kids at oh, gunpoint totally. getting the stuff, digging with their little fingers. And then you're taking the dumping it in a trash heap that's going to go to Brazil or China where some other kid is going to be picking to find the renewable parts and then sending it back to, you know, it's like what and the carbon footprint and the pollution and all that just so you could have your own friggin drill. The alternative, the re-socialized alternative is go down the street and knock on Bob's door. Bob is always, I always see him in his garage working on stuff. He's got lathes and and routers and tools. I don't even know what they are. Of course, he's got a drill. And he will not only lend me his big metal plug in, no nonsense drill, not the, you know, Rico disposable minimum of the drill, but he's going to come with that drill over to my house and go, Doug, you know, the place you want to put that hole. That's just drywall, man. You got to go to a stud. And then he's got this other tool called a stud finder. And he finds the stud. That's the piece of wood behind the wall. And he goes, that's where you want to drill the hole, man. And he's going to drill it in there and put an anchor and a thing and a who's it and go, there you are. And it's going to be great. Now, why don't I want to do that? Because I don't know if I like Bob. I don't, Bob. And Bob's got kids. But Bob might want something from me. 
right? Bob might want me because he knows I'm nerdy. He might want me to like help his daughter with her algebra homework or something. And then, oh my God, I'll be sitting at their kitchen table helping this 12 year old girl with her algebra. I mean, that, ooh, that might be horrible. Or what if I have a barbecue and then the Bob and his family are going to smell it. And because Bob came over and gave me and lent me the drill, aren't I kind of obligated now to invite Bob and his kids to our, oh, then they're going to come over and then they're going to try to be our friends. And then they're going to know people on my block. Ah, uh, right. That we see that as a problem, oddly enough, in the, in the American suburbs, when it shouldn't be the whole point, the whole point of, of, of neighborhood is that the reason why when someone, well, when I was a kid, anyway, someone moves into the neighborhood, someone new, you bring them a plate of brownies or something. Now, that's not actually a good favor, right? Because they've just moved into the house. Their kids are going to be scared shitless in their new bedrooms, right? And you're going to just jack them up. Let's, let's jack up the, <laughs> the new neighbor's kids on brownies right before they have their first sleep. No, you're not doing it because they need brownies. You're doing it because they need to feel obligated to you. That's the way you welcome them into the neighborhood is you do them a favor so they have a reason to come over and do a favor for you you're knitting them into the fabric of debt of community debt which is what helps us bond so we have to re-socialize and the way we re-socialize is by being it's not even just by doing favors for your neighbors it's by being willing to accept favors from your neighbors here totally, totally. and finally you know once once you're having those kinds of communal uh group experiences is my fourth intervention, which is to cultivate awe. You know, awe, a real experience of awe is an experience of connection. You're sort of one with everything, right? Whether even if, if you're looking at nature or looking at the Grand Canyon or looking at a, a baby squirrel being born or whatever. I don't know if you get to see that, but let's assume you <laughs> could. These are all going to be experiences of, of awe, right? Of awe. Or even for me, I have it sometimes if I'm at a good neighborhood barbecue and there's sound all around me. You know when kids are playing and you can go in the, you can hear them in 360. It's right. like what we call immersive sound in the technology world, but it's actually out in the real world all the time. It's all 360, all the time when you're, you're in your real world. Um, you have an experience of awe. When you have an experience of awe, you have a, a your body has a cytokine response that regulates your, your immune system. You know, you actually have a healthier immune response for like three days after an experience of awe. So you'll get less sick. You'll you have less allergies. Your your body is actually healthier. You will be more generous after an experience of awe. They've done tons of experiments. You're more likely to be more generous if someone asks you for money or for help after you've had experience of awe. And that's because awe is reminding you that you're not alone here, that you're part of this thing, that it's all there. And then it's it self-generates, right? Because then you will lend the thing to the neighbor and then you will be at the party and then you will have an ecstatic trance dance experience with neighbors that you'd other otherwise be embarrassed to even smile at right and so they all contribute to each other but this is what my books have been about really from the beginning you know denaturalizing power was my book life inc that wanted people to look at what is central currency what is the corporation when were they invented where did they come from why do we have them what is the automobile why does everyone have to have one? Oh, because gm went and lobbied to create an american suburban landscape where you needed a car to get to work people used to ride the streetcar home they drank a beer now they've got to spend one day working just to support their ownership of a car and they've got to operate heavy machinery with great risk for an extra hour or two every day when they come home from their job operating heavy machinery it's like duh you know unwind it and you can see oh let's let's denaturalize power let's challenge these underlying assumptions these things that we've mistaken for conditions of nature that's what life inc was doing triggering agency was programmer be programmed this book i wrote saying if you are not doing the programming if you are not aware of the programming you are being programmed right, right. it's the book that argues that kids getting add today which finally people are agreeing kids are getting so much ADD, not just because they have the actual organic ADD, but they are having an adaptive response to a world where someone's trying to colonize their attention and program <laughs> them everywhere they look, right? The, the uh, uh, re-socializing people was my book, Team Human. You know, how do we re-socialize? Re and the, 
the last one, you know, uh, uh, cultivating awe really goes to all of my fiction work, all of these, mm. the, the comics and the Judaism and even the first, you know, book, uh, Siberia that I wrote about the cyber era was about rave and psychedelics and all of the new sort of communal group experiences um, that people were, were uh, reinventing or retrieving, you know, and it's partly my, uh, uh, you know, new uh, adoration of um, indigenous people, indigenous societies, and their um, steadfast um, connection to experiences of awe. I mean, they know that these are way down low on Maslow's hierarchy of needs is awe. You know, I put it down there with, with uh, you know, food, food and shelter. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you're almost describing like the old hippie lifestyle. You know, that's what we figured out, you know, and then it, we had communes and then we had co-housing and then we had we had intentional communities and co-housing. And um, they were and, hard, though. They were exploited, you know, the, the but everything. See, this is this is part of it, too. And this is not said cynically. It said yeah. there is a con piece of the consciousness to cultivate at this point is to be able to, as you say, denaturalize power, to be able to see that these beautiful ideas that come, there's going to be, you know, threads of the old. There has to be the people who are creating these beautiful things are, are have been acculturated in, in, in the Western society. So it's almost like what I'm hearing you say, because what you're evoking is how I live, <laughs> by the way, you know, what you're evoking is the choices that I've made again and again and again and again and again in my life. Um, and to do that against the grain of the the order that is as as we know the order is come is going down this dominator society is gonna is going down and and resisting like crazy so you know i guess maybe like a wind up question here um would be uh so how do you stay a mensch in the world like this you know how do you continue how do you know not you, me, us, me, white people, but how, what do you see happening? What could possibly go right in this regard? What do you see happening that is cultivating this kind of joy, that is cultivating this kind of capacity to think critically and to differentiate between the false and the real? What do you see emerging that is actually, is actually sort of an intimation of the post-capitalist world? One is the kinds of questions that are raised by uh, uh, ubiquity and plentifulness of digital product forces a conversation. You know, the, the conversation we used to have was, First, they came for the cab drivers, and I said nothing because I'm not a cab driver. Right? <laughs> then they came for the writers, and I said nothing. Right? You know. Then they came, and now with AI, people are realizing, oh, you know, I guess an AI kind of could do most of my job, couldn't it? Um, and not caregivers, not you know, the ten percent of people who actually do something that's worth something, but the rest of us, you know, who are doing you know mortgage actuarial measurement calculations or the, the the vast majority of of customer service kinds of things and catalog writing and um the the, the bulk of stuff um we're not we're, we're starting to ask the other question you know when cnn interviews me about it what are we going to do about the unemployment problem that's what they always say what are we gonna do about the unemployment problem and what i say to them which comes off like a joke but is starting to trigger agency is, well, what if we thought about it as the unemployment solution? Like, huh? And then I'll say, well, I'm happy for robots to do all the work if I get to do all the play. And they're like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. you know, all right, we'll see you next, you know, <laughs> I'll see you next time. Thanks for this interview. Um, but it does, it triggers, well, wait a minute. Why are we working? Why do we have jobs? It, it, it initiates that process. All you got to start doing, people like us, is dropping in little thought bombs, little mm -hmm. 
little thought bombs that bombs is even the wrong word because it sounds weaponized um thought fungus um <laughs> <laughs> that that recolonizes and re-educates um sort of capitalist frameworks with other possibilities complementary possibilities capitalism doesn't go away you still need some capital at the table adam smith understood that you just now what about the land what about the labor what about the other things you know so you can start thinking about that but we can start thinking oh what if we don't have enough work for everyone to have a five-hour work day well then what then we'll have to share the work right well Wally, all right you can have you can work wednesdays if i can work thursday you know and then can you imagine it flipping to that side of things and i think it will i think it will so if we actually get good at things which we're not because none of the things we're doing are actually more efficient long term they're more extractive they, they you really want to farm properly we need more hands on the ground less tractors more people you can't do it the way we're doing it it's not tractors in monsanto you know chemicals right 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 don't work, not long term, not unless Mars is really coming and Mars doesn't seem to have good topsoil. So there's a, <laughs> there's a, a lot we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to geoform that place, uh, terraform it, there's it, it, a lot. It's easier to, ter it'll be easier to re-terraform Earth than to terraform Mars. So come back, come back here. Let's look back where we are. So um, I, I don't think it's as hard as all that. I think because the solution is so easy, it's counterintuitive. The the main critique mm -hmm. I get of my books, even from you know smart people like you know the 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 Washington Post and Boston Globe type reviewers, will say Rushka's book, his critique is great, but his solutions don't really make sense. He's saying you know we should share more and borrow more stuff. It's really old ideas. Like, okay, <laughs> Jesus had old ideas. <laughs> Right. I mean, those ones still sound pretty good to me. Buddha had old ideas. Right. Uh, these are just because they're old doesn't mean they're wrong. It means that we can that, that if anything, with the new stuff that we got, all the new toys and gizmos and iPhones and things, maybe the old ideas will work even better now than than they did for, uh, you know, intentional communities of years past. And with the experience of hippiedom, which I think from the hippies I've talked to got fucked up mostly because the guys did none of the work. They were out playing Frisbee stone and the women had to do everything. And it was, it wasn't, <laughs> well, I heard that's the way it went. I mean, that's a, that's a very glib. No, no, I don't, you know, here, I'll just pitch my, yeah. my thought as, as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing like the idea of regenerative agriculture, which we were talking about, we need a kind of agriculture that that actually increases fertility, not decreases fertility, right. increases life, not decreases life, et cetera. And that regenerative agriculture used to be like it's not on anybody's lips and now regenerative everything. It's sort of like the coolest thing. Now it's right. going to have. So um, I think there's a real push toward regeneration. And I think it's it's on the part of you know, maybe old hippies, you know, opened the way, but there are so many scientists, young people, people like really dedicated. I would say that, you know, even as the dehumanizing, very visible world is, is, you know, out there, you know, and we can all go just freak out like on a daily basis if you want to. I think that there's a, like a, a, a I feel it, this like chugging forward of, values and practices and attitudes and ways of being and ways of seeing that are coming right out of that more wholesome sense of living in this world. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how that becomes more evident because there's a resistance in the dominant media to, to telling these stories or they're just, they're sort of marginalized stories. But yeah. I, I do, I think what you're evoking is something that I can feel people yearning toward and I can feel people embodying. And I don't think it's just that I live in a nice little, you know, sort of privileged enclave of really good, sweet people. I, I just, I mean, even just, you know, I mean, yoga is commercialized and meditation is commercialized, but this impulse, this impulse toward, toward the healthy communities, healthy people, you know, that I think that impulse is actually, it's sort of like a, it's like another drumbeat, not quite as loud as the AI and freak out drumbeat, but I think it's there. I think it's there. You can disagree with me, but I mean, do you see that as well? 
Yes, I see that as well. In in my what could go right mindset, but and I'm saying but rather than and, um, even though I'm training myself to say and, this one's a but. But I've also seen remarkably, uh, almost heartbreaking awareness stir in people when they're dying. Mm -hmm. They've realized, oh my, I mean, the most horrible people, and I've been, I've been lucky to be at a lot of deathbeds. And I mean that non facetiously, Um, you see them in those last days, saying, it's all love, isn't it? That's all there is. That's Mm -hmm. the only thing. And they try to really get to know, I mean it, I really mean it. That's all there is everything is love. It's what's holding ourselves together. It's what's, it's what, and it's just love. And they realize it. I mean, and they feel it and it's beautiful. And that last three, four days of their life, they get it or three, four hours or three, four minutes for some. But the fact that so many people are having this inkling of, oh, wait a minute. Um, even the ones that you might call crazy, you know, who are who have the inkling and, the, and they're in a strange neighborhood. So then they say, they see that reflected in MAGA values or something else, um, because they understand everyone understands that there is some kind of a system that's gone out of control and is repressing and against that. And it's neoliberalism and neoliberalism is on the far head of Clinton and and uh, uh, uh uh, what was his name? Tony Blair, as much as it is on Ronald Reagan and, and George Bush. Right, right. Um, so it doesn't matter what face, how, who's, who the actor was, who you're blaming for it. They're all feeling that thing. But again, then what we have to do, I think, is, and we, I can say we have to, to you and me, but I wouldn't say this to, to I'm, not, I don't, I'm not saying people have to do something. Um, right. <laughs> but I think what what because that's against my thing about getting people to do stuff. I think what we have to do, though, is help people recognize the 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 soul love. Uh, what could go rightness about this right. emerging sensibility? Right. And there's still time. There is always time to change. Right. There's always time. Talk to any Catholic priest until that person's dead. They can always last write them into goodness. And um, the, 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 the fat lady has not sang, <laughs> sung. You know what I mean? The, we right. can, there's a lot of life yet on this planet. There's a lot of uh, mycelia that we could turn to to help us regenerate a whole lot of things and get the plastic out of the ocean. There's a ton. It's, it's, it's imminently fixable, right. imminently fixable. You know, if we can uh, uh, imagine um, a path toward that, toward that right. right. Imagination is so crucial, it's so crucial, and and also just you know in the in the face of of all odds, looking like an idiot, you know, just to conf- affirm love, to be generous, to greet people, to you know, it's like when you say what we can do, like you and me, Douglas, we're just having a, a strategy session here for like saving the world, right? So you and I, what we're going to do is. It's like, as you say, it's so simple. It's being love. It's being love and trusting love, you know, and keeping your powder dry, (laughs) you know. Um, And, um, but that's what I hear you saying in a way. It's like, what I see in your books and in you is that you are, you are sort of like a love bug. And then you've got all this sort of, you know, like ironic and snarky. And I mean, all these cool stuff, you know, that you can, you know that that you put out so that we can you can shock us shock at, into awe <laughs> you're shocking yeah, us into shock awe. And awe. but for sure i mean my mentors were the hippies tim leary robert <laughs> anton wilson yeah you know, exactly you you know uh, ram das uh, you know people with i mean they had good and bad features but this was the they were the hippies and yeah you know and really for for the most part they were right you know, I still wonder what it would have been like, and everyone who's done it says, oh, you wouldn't have liked it, but what it would have been like to be like raised on a kibbutz, you know, <laughs> with a right. bunch of, you know, bearded dudes and knit yarmulkes singing at guitars while we pick 
dates from the, I don't know. I don't think you would have survived it, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but I understand what you're saying. And it, it's almost like that there is, if you give up that there's some kind of Shangri-La, if you give up that there is a beauty and wholeness that's available to us and and that that our lives are tending toward that, if you give up that, then it is just a prosaic world. But, you know, I mean, it's you wouldn't have liked being at a commune, I mean, a, a kibbutz, but but you would have been there for a week and you would have, it would have planted something in you and you would have been carrying I, it forward. Oh, good. Then I could go back to the city. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But what I'm saying, and, and we're going to have to, we're going to have to wind up here. I feel safer in the city. I really do. I feel safer in the city than in the forest, but that's because it's, okay. it's where I'm oriented. But, but you I, like, be, you like talking about the forest and yeah. the mycelium as long as yeah. it's like out there. Out there. <laughs> Not in my apartment, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just, I, what I'm saying is what I'm hearing from you. It's a, it is a very, it's like, don't lose heart in the midst of all of this that's churning and crumbling and venal and heartless. Don't lose heart. That's not an instruction. That's not like me telling you, hey, you don't lose heart. Like I could lose heart if I want to. <laughs> But just what I sort of hear you saying is like, don't lose heart. We're magnificent beings. You know, we have a capacity for love. Don't lose heart. I mean, it's almost like that is a very potent instruction at this time when it would be easy to lose heart. So anyway, that's 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 my wind up. Yeah. So do you have any final words for us, my friend? No, I love you. I love getting to do this, uh, to, to, to bask in positive possibility is a nice, a nice feeling. It's like singing gospel music or something, <laughs> which you know? I love. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? It fills I with, do. but it's not, it's not hope. It's not hope. It's something else. Um, I don't know what the word would be for it, but it's, it's good. It's a, it's a kind of re-socialized awe is what it is you know Perfect. and it's not and, it, and it's nice it's all it's all possible you know and that's the thing that really we have to fight with the ai you know is is and that's where i'll go at the end that's how i'll wrap up you know it's it's the possible is very different from the probable mm -hmm. the ai is enforcing the probable yielding the most probable combination of words from the past if we use that as our guide we all die, right? You can't use the probable. You have to use the possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.